Let's have a lesson on this piece. Uh, follow the lesson for free, uh, but if you're interested, you can also pick up the free PDF sheet music. Uh, there's a link for that in the description. Uh, there's no sign up or anything. You just download the free PDF and follow along. Um, so this is part of a collection of relatively easy works that I'm putting together as a supplement to my volume one and volume two method books. This particular piece, I would recommend playing probably during my, well, after my volume one, uh, just because of, of some of those some of those fingerings in the key signature. Um, but certainly any time during my volume two would be just fine. Uh, although I did experiment with adding bass notes to this particular piece, I decided to just leave it as is, the original, you know, Celtic jig, um, and as an opportunity to work on on a really natural pulse and feeling of the rhythm of the 6-8 time and and the legato melody so like you know just being able to to glide through those notes and also an opportunity to really work on your im alternation um, skills in melody reading so it's just a it's a really great opportunity to play a single line even though it, it does kind of feel like there's two voices and we'll talk about that in a second um nevertheless it is a good opportunity to play you know a single line at least in notation um, just like a, a cellist or a violinist or a, fl a flute player would, would do, and to make it very high quality. Let's just have a brief discussion on the time signature, 6-8. So that's six eighth notes per measure. So the way we would divide that up is um, one, two, three, four, five, six. Or strong, weak, weak, medium, strong, weak, weak. So strong, weak, weak, medium, strong, weak, weak. So um, when you think about 6-8 time, you can think about counting like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But that it's a little bit too much to think of it in that way. There's so many beats. Uh, um, usually the way a conductor would conduct it would be just in two beats per bit. Two, two beats per measure. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So essentially just thinking here, 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 here. Thump, thump, thump. So you just get to think one, da, da, two, da, ba. One, da, da, two, da, da. Instead of one, two, three, four, five, six you know, so many beats, you just get to feel two beats per measure, really, and then you just you just play it naturally. So that there's always like a little bit of a, sometimes a difference between the technical time signature, which is a, is a very specific thing to notation, and then the way we just naturally feel something and the way we simplify music so that we don't get um, too much pulse or too many beats just over and over and over. Um, instead, we simplify it, we just get the main beats, and that's what brings simplicity to, um, to a time signature that has so many beats. We just feel it in two, even though there's six beats per measure. So yeah, two main pulses, six beats. Um, however you want to say it, um, it's, it's, it's a feeling versus um, a technical aspect of, of the time signature. So a um, couple of things about this piece. So the main thing I think that you'll want to work on is um, 
um, just the right hand fingering and the tempo of the piece but of course start off as you know as slow as you need to and work your way up i've decided to just use i m alternation the whole time um, except for measure 14 where i've kind of used the thumb to to create a bass line there although i don't create it it's built into the original <laughs> back to just alternating of I and M. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So I think we can just do a walkthrough of the piece and discuss a few things. Because we are playing this as a single line uh, piece, um, I do mute out that those low Ds. If we don't, we get them ringing out the whole time. Which is just fine that the sustain eventually dies away so my recommendation first is to play the piece and don't worry about muting those open D's just play it with with I am keeping a thumb planted on a lower string and let it ring out it it'll still sound really really good it sounds fine without muting those uh, but then uh, as a follow-up step if you wish to take a, take a further step with the piece and learn a new skill then you can um, include the muting, which we'll talk about. So without the muting, you just play. You know, and just keep alternating those fingers. It sounds just fine like that. Um, if you're going to mute those Ds, just the, just the fourth string Ds, what I would do is I would mute them on the, the downbeat of the next measure. So you can see I put my thumb on the fourth string as soon as the next, the first beat of the next measure came up and that thumb muted out the sound. I'll demonstrate again. So as soon as I play that B, I place my thumb on that string to mute it out. And then you can just lift your thumb, mute, mute. That's all. Um, but like I said, when you're first learning the piece, and especially if you're, you know, more on the first method book stage, uh, do not worry about muting it out. It's not necessary. If after learning the piece you like the sound of, of it muted, then by all means practice putting your thumb on that string to stop the sound after on the next on the next measure. Um, besides that, there's there's no complications in this piece. It's all first position playing. We do have an F sharp that comes up sometimes with our fourth finger, but let's just do a walkthrough of the piece. I'll go a little slower. second ending now. Here, you don't have to worry about uh, muting that, that bass, if you are worrying about it, um, because the F mutes it out automatically. Measure 14, thumb, M, I, thumb. So on those, because we're kind of creating a little bass line there, not in the notation, but in our performance, you're gonna leave your second finger down to here, leave your third finger down to here, leave your second finger down. And the reason we use three on A there is because our second finger is on B. So measure 14 one more time. So it, 
you know, uh, being able to just alternate your fingers, I think is the challenge for students here. The notes themselves, not too difficult. That F sharp that you have to play, just remember that if your hand is misaligned, you, like I can't even, if I'm even just slightly misaligned, I can't even reach that F sharp. It's like really, my finger's fully extended, I can't reach it. But if I swing this knuckle in and align my hand, you know, parallel with my knuckles parallel with the strings, and then just bring this up a little bit, I can easily reach that F sharp, or a C, C sharp, or a G sharp, or beyond. Um, but slight misalignment, and it's, it's really hard to reach. So you'll often see students kind of, you know, lunging their hand for that F sharp, but just make sure that your hand is in a good position so that you can tap that A and tap that F sharp. Um, very easily, uh, but it's all about your hand position and your guitar position. So as long as you're all aligned and you haven't let your hand position float away, then you should be able to reach that without any trouble. Um, but yeah, um, like alternating your fingers, there will be some times when an awkward string crossing occurs and the I finger has to reach above the M. That's normal. It happens in scales all the time. Every time you play a scale, you do awkward string crossings. So having it occur in a melody is just fine. We could have played this slightly differently using our thumb for the, for the Ds and throwing the A finger in to, to avoid awkward string crossings. But it's such, a, it's such a good thing for students sometimes to just be able to say, I'm going to alternate I am for this piece. And that's, that's it. They don't have to pay attention. Well, they don't have to overthink the right hand fingering too much. They just have a concept of fingering and they apply it. So as long as they've, they've practiced, you know, they practice scales and things like that, they should be able to, to play through a single line passage alternating and just dealing with anything, any of the string crossings that come up. A string crossing is just when you have to, ergonomically speaking, reach the I finger to a higher string than the M finger. No big deal, like I said, we do it in scales all the time, so, but nevertheless, students will, will have to just make sure they work on smoothing that process out, that technique out. So I hope you enjoyed that. It's just a nice single line, it's an opportunity to play a single line passage uh, really high quality. There's also so just some implied bass notes by letting some of those fourth and fifth strings ring out, um, creating kind of something more of a full piece, but again, an opportunity to play a, a single line passage.